earlier today what is being described as a historic agreement among Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain was signed at the White House. In his remarks, President Trump noted that his first foreign trip as president was to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So that begs the question, if and when might we see Saudi Arabia normalize relations with Israel? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Falk, President of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And tonight we have with us David Rundell, one of our country's most knowledgeable diplomats on Saudi Arabia, and the author of a new book, Vision or Mirage, Saudi Arabia at the Crossroads. And he'll be in conversation with a very good friend who happens to be Vice Chairman of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth, Ambassador Robert Jordan. Before we get started, let me just remind you that you can purchase a copy of Vision or Mirage by going to enterabangbooks.com. And frequent viewers know that all you have to do is type in DFW World to get 10% off on Vision or Mirage or any books that are in your shopping cart. And I think you saw by looking at our little sizzle video, there are lots of books to buy over the course of the next few weeks. I want to especially thank our promotional partner today, the SMU Tower Center, as well as an anonymous donor who is supporting this program in particular. To keep up with our programs, I hope you'll go to our YouTube channel, and again, just type in DFW World to watch all of our past programs, and we hope that you'll share them with your own social network. So let me just briefly tell you a little bit about our Vice Chairman, Ambassador Robert Jordan. He was ambassador to Saudi Arabia at a most difficult time. He was appointed by George W. Bush and arrived in the kingdom shortly after the 9-11 attacks, where he served with great distinction. Today, he is an adjunct professor at uh, Southern Methodist University, and uh, he wrote his own memoir, and we happen to see that right there on the bookshelf. Uh, that's a good way to be sure his questions aren't too difficult tonight. So you see Ambassador Jordan's book, Desert Diplomat. I have it on my bookshelf as well. Inside, uh, Desert Diplomat, Inside Saudi Arabia Following 9-11. So you can purchase two books tonight at enterabangbooks.com. So with that, Bob, I turn it over to you, and I look forward to enjoying the program. Great, thank you very much, Jim. It's really a pleasure to have David Rendell with us uh, this evening. Um, David is uh, someone who was actually at the embassy, uh, or our, their consulate in Jeddah, I guess, and at the embassy in Riyadh uh, after 9-11 when I arrived. Uh, he was commercial counselor at the time, as I recall, uh, did a terrific job and has had really an illustrious career. He has probably over the last 30 years uh, spent more time focused on and working in Saudi Arabia than any other diplomat maybe in history. But he has served as uh, Chief of Mission, Charge d'Affaires, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission, Political Counselor, Economic Counselor, uh, and Commercial Counselor. Uh, David, is, in my view, is kind of a Swiss Army knife of uh, diplomacy. Uh, he uh, can really handle just about anything, and he is also a multi-talented uh, historian, political scientist, uh, oil and gas expert, and I would say anthropologist uh, as well. He studied Arabic at Oxford. Uh, he has been uh, uh, counseling many uh, significant figures uh, over the years uh, on the Middle East and continues in his consulting practice uh, today. So David, uh, welcome uh, to the World Affairs Council. Uh, it's a really a, a great pleasure to see you, and, and after about uh, 18, 17, 18 years uh, back, uh, at least face-to-face -face, uh, electronically. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed this book, and I should add that uh, a number of uh, truly distinguished figures have uh, provided rave reviews of the book, including Henry Kissinger, General David Petraeus, uh, and many others. So it's, it's a great read. Uh, I think uh, Chaz Freeman, former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, has said that it is the definitive work uh, on Saudi Arabia and will uh, be so uh, for many years to come. Uh, certainly the next time I teach my course at SMU, it will be required reading. Let me ask you to start off, uh, David, uh, why did you write the book? What prompted you to write this uh, wonderful book? That's a good question. Um, I wrote this book really for my successors at the American Embassy. And in fact, I um, 
told the publisher that I was really writing it for only one person, and that was the next ambassador at the American Embassy. And they told me that that's great, but we'd like to sell more than one book. So, um, <laughs> so you're going to have to change this a little bit. In fact, it was probably a lot longer to begin with. It was more encyclopedic, and it became uh, more of a a book that a lot of people could read, not just uh, an ambassador who was going out to Saudi Arabia. But I, I did this because I thought, and, and I was convinced really, that uh, Saudi Arabia is an unusual place. It's a very, I spent, as you said, 15 years of my 30 year career I spent there. And that is uh, unusual and prob probably unprecedented. And so I was well aware of how unusual a place Saudi Arabia is. And what do I mean by that? I mean, for example, I would, when I was the political counselor, I would speak to my young political officers, the junior officers, and I would tell them, look, you should take your political science book and throw it out the window because that's not going to help you understand how Saudi Arabia works. If you want to understand Saudi Arabia, go buy a book on Tudor England and figure out how Henry VIII ran England. And then you'll understand how Saudi Arabia works today. It's a monarchy. It's the last strategically important monarchy on the planet and certainly the only monarchy in the G20. Uh, then when I was the economic counselor, as you mentioned, uh, I spoke to my junior officers and I would say to them, you really should take your economics textbooks and throw those out the windows as long, along with those political science books because Saudi Arabia functions very differently. Uh, than most normal economies. How do you have fiscal policy, for example, in a country that has no taxes? How do you have monetary policy in a country where the currency is pegged to the dollar and that effectively means that interest rates are determined by the Federal Reserve? Or for just a final example, you could have the, something called the Keynesian multiplier, which means that you, the government spends money and that money is then trickles through the economy as multiplied. And in Saudi Arabia, you'll find that much of the money that is paid out by the government is actually sent home to um, Manila or to Karachi. So there's a multiplier in Pakistan and the Philippines, but much less so than, uh, in, uh, than in Saudi Arabia. So those are just a couple of examples of why Saudi Arabia is an unusual place and uh, not easy for Westerners to understand. And so that was really why I wrote the book, to help them, uh, to help them understand that. One of the interesting parts of the book, and there are many interesting parts, uh, is the beginning in which you set out the two and a half century history of Saudi Arabia under the Al Saud uh, re various regimes. Uh, why is that history important to understanding Saudi Arabia? Well, that's a good question as well. Um, the stability of Saudi Arabia uh, rests and the, and the stability uh, is a result of the legitimacy of the government. So the legitimacy and the stability of that monarchy rest on several things. And the first one is historic legitimacy from the fact that they created the country. Uh, before, I, won't, I don't want to get into, to turn this into a history lecture, but there were, have been several different Saudi re iterations of the Saud of the El Saud dynasty. The third iteration, which really began around 1900, uh, took Saudi Arabia from a collection of little tribal statelets. It looked very much like the United Arab Emirates. If you know the United Arab Emirates, there are seven different Emirates. You've probably heard of Dubai and Abu Dhabi, but many of the listeners probably have never heard of Ras Al Hema or Umm Al Kawain or Sharjah. So there were, there were many of these little states and the El Saud family, through um, diplomacy and through warfare, uh, united them all into a one cohesive unit. And in doing so, uh, they did a couple of other things. They unified um, the religion of the kingdom, which had at one point been Muslim, but there were many different versions of Islam in Saudi Arabia. They have their own particular brand and they created a unified legal system, which in Saudi Arabia, in, in the Islamic world, the is legal system and the, um, and the uh, religious system are, are together. So they created a unified legal system. A, they created a unified political system. 
Uh, and then the final thing they did is, is that, and it's important, is that they um, suppressed the independence of the tribes. Tribes used to roam around um, in the desert uh, more or less independently. They had their own government, their own military, and the El Saud put an end to that. So um, that's a rather perhaps too long an explanation about how basically, that, to put it in a nutshell, they created the country. They unified a disparate peninsula that had never really been unified in a thousand years, and that gives them certain legitimacy in the, the eyes of the people today. And this historical role of the Al Saud is one of what you call the five pillars uh, of uh, understanding uh, the kingdom's stability. Uh, the others are the ability to manage peaceful successions, uh, the ab ability to uh, manage competing interests among their many stakeholders, uh, the ability to uh, deliver reasonably competent government, and then the ability to adapt. And you, you have mixed this together in a really interesting way. Uh, and at the end of each chapter, you suggest what the challenges are going forward based upon these uh, five pillars uh, that, uh, that I have mentioned. Uh, and then you, of course, refer back frequently to the title of the book, Vision or Mirage. What do you mean by that title? Well, the, the Saudis have uh, a comprehensive program now for social and economic change, uh, for social liberalization and for economic diversification. And this plan is called Vision 2030 because it's supposed to be implemented by 2030. It began in 2015, it really was announced in 2016. And so the question that the book asks um, and hopefully answers is, is, is this a vision uh, or is it a mirage, a, 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 an ephemeral illusion that uh, is not really going to happen? Certainly the Saudis have tried to do some of these things before. They have tried to diversify their economy. I wouldn't say they've tried to liberalize their um, social structure too, too dramatically in the past, although there have been some changes. So the, that's the question really is, is um, whether or not this is going to work. Uh, and I think I can sort of preempt the next question, which is, is it going to work? And the answer is it, yes, it is working to some extent. In fact, it's working quite a lot in the social sphere and it's working less so, but still considerably in the economic sphere. And we could talk about that if, you're, if you want, but uh, I believe that um, it probably should have been called Vision 2050. Uh, then you'd be more likely to actually achieve all these goals. I don't think they'll be achieved by 2030, but if you called it 2050, everybody would have said, great, that's something for my son to worry about or my daughter, and it would have not been a very uh, compelling so they made it 2030 and they're pushing hard to get to, to get there. And uh, I think they will, they have already achieved quite a bit of it. And I think they'll achieve more of it in time. So for an American audience, as we get into this, um, hearing uh, uh, about these uh, elaborate plans, here we are almost energy independent in the United States. Uh, why in 2020 should Americans care about Saudi Arabia? Oh, that's a good question as well. You have, you have a lot of good questions. Um, so um, why should America care about Saudi Arabia? Well, first reason America should care about Saudi Arabia is about energy. Uh, and it is, it is about oil. Um, the United States is independent, uh, has become independent. Uh, but globally, oil, oil is still traded on a global market. And so the price of oil uh, does depend on Saudi Arabia's ability to produce large quantities of oil in a predictable and stable uh, fashion. And if something were to happen to Saudi Arabia, which produces on an average day 10% of the global production, if Saudi Arabia were to uh, deteriorate into something like Libya, uh, which, you know, what we'd have there is, you know, a dozen tribes fighting over oil wells, uh, if that happened in Saudi Arabia, you would, you, the rest of the world would see it. Now, even if the United States was able to continue producing its own oil and remained independent, um, the rest of the world would go into, would, would, would face very high prices, and that would affect our trading partners, and it would affect the global economy. So 
while we're independent, uh, the world is not independent and we're not independent of the world. So I guess I would put it that way. Um, but there are, it goes beyond that. Rachel um, Bronson wrote a book called Thicker Than Oil, which also talks about the American-Saudi relationship. And she makes, it's a good analogy. I mean, it is, it is thicker than oil. Um, Saudi Arabia is a status quo power that wants to see stability in the Middle East. We also are a status quo power, which is to say we have a lot of things about the way the current situation exists that we like. Uh, there are people who don't feel that way. Uh, there are people who don't like the way the situation is at the moment and want to change it and have revolutionary ambitions of one sort or another. The Saudis confront these really two types of people, two groups, two factions. One is the Iranians who have their revolution and want to challenge the Saudis, but not only in OPEC, but also for their leadership in the Islamic world. And then we have the Islamists um, who are another group that... Uh, largely follow a, a, a philosophy that is uh, associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. They are, they are con some of them are considered terrorists by the United States. They don't always call themselves a Muslim Brotherhood. Some places they call themselves Hamas or in Turkey, they call themselves the AK party. But um, this is another group which actually doesn't, and then in, in Egypt is a good example where the um, Muslim Brotherhood government actually took over for, for a year. These people, um, are revolutionary, they want to have change, and uh, Saudi Arabia feels threatened by them, and to some extent, so are our interests, not perhaps as dramatically as by Iran, but so any event, the Saudis are a status quo power. Um, and then I think the final thing is the, um, that the Saudis have a large role to play in uh, Islam. And right now, and I think the ambassador uh, would agree with me that really for the last 20 years, the Saudis have been trying to have a moderate role in Islam. There was a time when you could argue that they um, promoted a more intolerant view of, of Islam and uh, promoted jihad, particularly during the Afghan war, where we were quite happy to have them promote jihad uh, against the Russians. Uh, but after really certainly in the last, after 9-11, and then after Osama bin Laden began attacking them, uh, and they, as you probably know, they had three years of a, of a major, um, I guess you would call it an insurrection with, um, with Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia, where dozens of policemen and hundreds of people were killed. So they have been trying quite uh, deliberately to present a more moderate form of Islam, and that's important to us. They've been helping, they've been a big help to us in counterterrorism activity. We can talk about that if you'd like, counterterrorism and finance. And then finally, I, the question came up today about um, peace with Israel. Saudi Arabia is a status quo power, as I began to say. Um, they don't like things which rock the boat. They don't like Nasser if he's preaching Arab nationalism. They don't like Khomeini preaching revolution. They don't like bin Laden preaching his form of jihad. And they don't like the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, which is a destabilizing factor. And they have twice tried, both King Fahad and King Abdullah had peace plans, which they put forward, which at the time were the most advanced peace process, peace program that the Arabs were able to agree upon. So they have... Um, tried to solve the Arab-Israeli problem. They would like to have it solved. And the Crown Prince has certainly um, has said many times on, on uh, television and in interviews that he would like to see the issue resolved. I don't think the fact that he's building his new city, Neom, 30 miles from Elat, is an accident. So, anyway, I think those are some of the reasons, and I'll just summarize them again. Energy, stability in the Middle East, peace with Israel, and a more moderate role in uh, in um, the Islamic world. And I'll just, I'll flip that and say just one last thing. And that other reason that we should worry about, which we should care about Saudi Arabia is that the alternative to the current monarchy, that's important. What the alternative to the current monarchy is not the Canadian parliament, okay? If the, if the El Saud disappear, uh, you will probably end up with ISIS or the Muslim Brotherhood, and almost certainly a government which is less capable of producing oil and uh, less uh, inclined it to be friendly, really, to, to the West. So those are all reasons why we um, should consider the stability of Saudi Arabia to be important. You've mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood, and we have a question from the audience, which is, is the Muslim Brotherhood uh, on friendly terms with the United States? That's a good question. Well, I think the, you know, the, the Muslim Brotherhood is a... 
It's not a state and it's not a unified organization. It is, it is a collection of parties that share, that are sort of kindred spirits that are in many different countries. And in some countries, they are peaceful, uh, pro-democracy people uh, who believe that Islam should play a more important role in society uh, and believe that Islam is the, is the solution to um, their social and economic problems but do so peacefully. In other places, they are terrorists, okay? I mean, Hamas is considered to be a terrorist by the United States, terrorist organization by the United States, by the United U, uh, European Union, by Israel, by Saudi Arabia. Uh, so in some places, they, they, have, they have a violent streak. Um, there, are other, uh, there, there are places, I guess you would say, where there are political party. Um, Islam party is in, uh, is in Yemen. Um, as I say, the AK party in, um, in uh, Turkey. And in Egypt, they have been terrorists. I mean, they have definitely, they, and, it, they're, and I think it's fair to say, if, not, not trying to defend the Muslim Brotherhood, but it's, they, they became more violent when Nasser, and really to a considerable extent, Sadat, um, threw them in jail and tortured them. And they were, they were treated very harshly, and that push them into becoming more violent. Uh, so they are a organization which has many faces. I guess I would leave it at that. And then you mentioned uh, that the Saudis being a status quo power do not like to see the conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis. Uh, today, uh, as Jim Falk mentioned, uh, was uh, a notable day uh, because of the signing of the so-called Abraham Agreement, the agreement between the Israelis and the Emiratis uh, as well as uh, Bahrain. Um, where do you think the Saudis will come out on, on that agreement? Well, I don't think the Saudis will lead the parade. I think they will wait for an Arab consensus to form. And I think that they will do a lot to push the creation of that consensus. I think they consulted heavily with um, UAE and certainly Bahrain before either of those two made this decision. And I think that many of the factors that pushed uh, the UAE and Bahrain to towards this um, solution or this agreement uh, also exist within Saudi Arabia. So the fact that they, and, and uh, what are those? I think briefly, uh, just quickly, why did those, what, what are the forces that are pushing them towards it? I think, um, First of all, the cost benefit of um, not having peace with Israel has changed so that the cost of not having peace with Israel has gone up. The Saudis would like, just like the UAE would like to have trade, they would like to have tourism, they would like to have technology transfer, they would like to have investment with Israel. All of those things, um, as, as the Arab Gulf states have become more prosperous, they're interest in dealing with Israel uh, has increased. So at the same time, the, if you will, the benefit of not having relationships with Israel, which is to say to maintain this Arab unity, uh, pro-Palestinian feeling, uh, that has declined. The benefit that the average Saudi feels, and certainly uh, the ones I talk to when I talked to quite a few of them, that's declined. And it is very much a generational issue. Um, older people over 60, perhaps, perhaps uh, they are angry about the state, about this agreement. They believe that, uh, that, that Arabs should remain united, that the Palestinians have been betrayed. Uh, but if you talk to people under 30, and that's half the population of Saudi Arabia, uh, they have a very different view. Uh, they, they will remind you that the Palestinians were ungrateful, that they, um, they sided with Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War, that they have not used many opportunities where they could have found a solution. Uh, and, and many of them just feel it's over. It's time that we move on. That they, I, I talk to them. They say, no, I'd like to go to Jerusalem. I'd like to, I'd like to go to Israel. I'd like to be able to fly over there. So there's the cost benefit thing is, has, has relationship has changed. 
I think the, um, the second factor which drew, pushed the Emiratis and is also pushing the Saudis uh, is the, the threats that they face. And I mentioned those briefly that they feel threatened by Iran and they also feel threatened by the Islamists uh, who are, are no friends of monarchies. The, the Muslim Brotherhood don't like kings. Uh, and then the final factor, I think, again, which all of them are influenced by is the United States. They want to maintain good relationship with the United States. Uh, they don't want the United States to leave the Middle East. They feel that they were a stabilizing force. Uh, and they would, and they understand that the United States would like to see this resolved as well. And I think the current administration did work hard to try and bring this about. And uh, they, I don't think that the Emiratis did it so that they would, uh, could, so they could buy a new airplane. I think they had other reasons, but I think, I think maintaining a cordial relationship with the United States and with the new, new administration, whoever that may be, maybe the continuation of the old one, maybe a new one, but this will help them with that. And I would also argue though that, um, and this is my last comment on this, is that um, I don't expect, I could be wrong, but I would not expect anybody else to come step forward uh, until after the election. I think people will want to see how, how that shakes out before the next candidates people talk about, and I think they're right, are perhaps um, Sudan, perhaps Morocco, uh, maybe Oman. Uh, these, are, these are the next candidates, and uh, I, don't, I don't think they're going to happen today or tomorrow. So I, I want us to stay on uh, some of the current issues, but to provide that the context that's helpful to understanding current issues, let's take another step back in time. Uh, we have King Abdulaziz who consolidates uh, the kingdom in 1932. Uh, he passes away in 1953. Uh, you have King Saud who comes in, who turns out to not be up to the task. Uh, he is replaced ultimately by uh, King Faisal. 1975, King Faisal is assassinated uh, by a nephew. Uh, so you have, a, you have periods of instability here uh, for various reasons, but then you come down to uh, King Khalid, and in your book you make a very interesting observation that he really set the tone for the governing by consensus that typified uh, the Al Saud rule until 2015 when King Salman took over. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on that progression and how Salman turned out to be somewhat different? Yes. Um, <clears throat> along with the role in creating the country in the first place, another factor in the monarchy's legitimacy and the country's stability has been their ability, their capability to peacefully and rapidly transfer power from one to another. And there's usually a king and a crown prince and sometimes even a deputy crown prince. So there are three, we know who the next two people will be. And when the king died or when the king was assassinated, the um, transition took place very quickly. I was there for three of these transitions and uh, they took place very quickly and smoothly. Uh, and that added, um, added stability, but also popularity to the regime because in many countries in the Middle East, that's just not the case. Now you talked about the problem with King Saud and that's right, that was a messy transition, uh, was destabilizing and it took almost a decade to work it out. Um, and, and just to, uh, to back up a little bit, what was going on there was basically the transition from the generation one, which is the King Ibn Saud or King Abdulaziz, to his sons. And basically King Saud was planning to put his sons in charge. That's really, everyone talks about King Saud was bungling the economy, he was bungling the foreign policy, which is true. But what really got his brothers united against him was the fact that he was making it pretty clear that he was putting his sons in charge of every ministry and that he planned to hand the, neck, the monarchy over to his sons. And his brothers said, no, that's not going to happen. Um, so then we had really 60 years of these brothers uh, all working together and handing the crown off one to the next to the next. And that was the generation two system. And it was, as you say, a consensus driven system. 
So we come now to a change. Uh, and you know, a lot of changes that are going on in Saudi Arabia, people lay at the feet of King Salman or um, his son, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS. And to some extent that's true, but to some extent these things were inevitable. And I think that is something that people should focus on as well, is that these changes had to happen. The generation two princes were all coming to an end. The system that had worked for 60 years, people say King Salman got rid of it. Well, he didn't really get rid of it. It uh, ended by itself because all the brothers were dead. So he had to come up with a new system. And that was never gonna be easy. That was never gonna be um, painless. Uh, all the grandsons of King Abdulaziz could never be as powerful as or as rich as their fathers, the sons of King Abdulaziz had been. And they couldn't all be ministers and they couldn't all be generals. And while there were, you know, what, 34 living sons when the king died, there are well over 500 grandsons. So some of them were gonna get pushed aside. And this could have very easily become a Game of Thrones, a very destabilizing Game of Thrones. And what King Salman did, and I think he deserves credit for this, and I think it it's, should be focused on, is that he basically engineered the rise of the person that he thought would do the best job, which is his son, Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, he chose him, he picked him for whatever reasons, and we could elaborate on that, but he, he didn't just pick someone, he, and he, did, he could have picked um, one of his nephews easily if he just wanted to keep it within his own branch of the family. He could have picked one of his older sons if he just wanted to keep it his own sons. He picked one of his own younger sons and engineered his rise to power um, in order to secure the succession. And I would argue that right now that looks pretty clear that that will be um, Mohammed bin Salman unless something happens to him. And that is the last thing to say on this is that is one reason why the country is a little bit less stable today in that there is something that in finance they call the key man risk. And that would be that if something were to happen to Mohammed bin Salman or if he were be, to be removed, it's not clear who would come after him. There is no number three guy now. Uh, and so it's, it, if something were to happen to him, it, would easy, it could easily be a free for all, which is exactly what the king tried to avoid. And I'm not sure the king has the physical or mental uh, ability, he's, he's 82 years old, whether he would be able to engineer another, uh, pick someone and engineer his rise to power like he did with his son, Mohammed bin Salman. Okay, well, the, the, as I say, the phones are lighting up here. We've got a okay, tremendous I'm number of uh, interesting I'm questions. And so I'm going to start firing away at you uh, with uh, some of them. Um, okay. One from Don, what are the most important misconceptions Americans have about Saudi Arabia? In other words, if I travel to Saudi Arabia for the first time, what would most surprise me? Well, today what would most surprise you is um, how liberal the place is with all the, all the stories you've heard, which were true five years ago. Uh, if, so if, you, if you'd never been there, that might not surprise you quite so much. If you'd been there five years ago and you came back today, you would be shocked. I mean, literally shocked. I mean, everyone knows that women are driving, but the restrictions on women have uh, changed dramatically. They were not just women couldn't drive, but they were, um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> they, uh, there was an entire network of regulations that were referred to as the guardianship rules. And this meant that women couldn't start a business, couldn't open a bank account, couldn't put their children in school, couldn't travel, couldn't get a passport, all, couldn't get a cesarean section a delivery um, without their guardian, who is usually their husband or their father, uh, signing off. Um, those have largely been um, removed. So that's a big change. Um, most of my career, there were really strict religion or, uh, restrictions on what women, what jobs women could do. Uh, they couldn't be engineers, they couldn't be um, geologists, uh, they couldn't be lawyers. Uh, most of those things, again, there are still a few, but most of them have, have faded away. Uh, used to be no music in Saudi Arabia. Now they, they have rock concerts. So it used to be, um, you had to go, you couldn't go to a restaurant with someone who wasn't your wife. And even if you were, you ha even if you were with your wife, you had to sit in a special section 
that's largely disappeared. So a lot of these things have, socially, Saudi Arabia is a, is a new place. That's real. I think that would uh, be something that if you heard about the old Saudi Arabia would, would, would shock you. Um, what, um, another thing which I think is a misconception about Saudi Arabia is the fact that um, most of the people there are happy with their government. Um, that's very sh sh shocking to a lot of Americans. Americans tend to put countries into two groups. We tend to think either you're a republic and a democracy, which is focused on human rights and freedom and liberty and the individual, or you're a dictatorship and a tyranny that is run purely by fear. Uh, and we have this belief that all monarchies are tyrannies. So, and that's partly because of our own story. We all thought, we were all taught as children that wicked King George was a tyrant, he even says he's a tyrant in our Declaration of Independence. So we assume that all kings are tyrants. I think um, Ambassador Jordan would agree with me that uh, King Abdullah was not a tyrant. Uh, he, he was actually referred to as the King of Hearts. Uh, people were very fond of him. And so I think that would be another thing that would shock people, that the Saudis, per people, by and, by and large, uh, I, uh, um, I would say not, that's underestimated. The overwhelming majority of them uh, do not want to get rid of their monarchy. It's not that the people are being held down and repressed by a, uh, by a tyrannical regime. There are dissidents, there are people who want change, and I would say that it's interesting to find that, that there are people on both the left and the right who want radical change. There are people who think that the king is too liberal and that he ought, to, he ought to get back to the way things used to be, and there are people who think that he's not going fast enough. And quite honestly, he's thrown them both in jail. Uh, that's, that's, that's true. But the majority of the people, um, it must be an interesting jail with the, the, the far left and the far right both in there. But um, yeah. end event, I think that would be a, something else that would, would surprise people. Now here's a related question from Farhat. How sincere are these current efforts to expand women's rights in Saudi Arabia? Is it an economic realization that women's increased inclusion in the workforce will improve economic growth? Uh, or is it a way to appease the younger generation that believes in greater gender equality or both? I think it's both. I think it's, it's both. I mean, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting statistic. I mean, when Vision 2030 began, the labor force participation rate for women was 20%. That's one of the lowest in the world. Five years later, it's 30%. So 30% of Saudi women are working now. That's an increase of 50% in five years. That's quite dramatic. On the other hand, the United States, the number is 60%. So they're still, they came a long ways in five years, but they're still only half as far as the United States. Um, I think they recognize that that is a, um, an economic drawback. It's a problem. They're, half the smart people, uh, capable people are women and they should be allowed to work. The Crown Prince has been pretty aggressive about that. Actually, you will, you will, if you go to Saudi Arabia, you will find that um, government agencies and major corporations have an active uh, affirmative action program for women, which is happening. Uh, so I think it's um, sincere. I also think it's something that the people wanted. Yes, the crown prince is betting on demographics and um, it's made him very popular. Um, and it, interestingly enough, it's made him popular not so much with upper class and middle, even upper middle class women. It's made him popular with poor women. And I, um, I talk, was talking to one of these ladies and uh, sitting there talking to her, I said, so what did the, what did the crown prince do for you? And she just looked at me and she said, what did he do for me? He changed my life. Uh, you know, now I, I have, I'm a single mother. I, um, I used to have to spend all my money uh, getting a driver to take me to work. Uh, now I bought a Hyundai and I can get to work myself. Uh, she, it, it made a big difference to her. Now, if you're, you know, the lady who's got three BMWs and two chauffeurs for each one of them, you really don't care. You probably don't want to drive anyways. Uh, my wife was certainly happy that she didn't have to drive. Uh, but um, I think for, the, for many Saudi women, it's made a big difference in their life. Here are a, a, a couple of questions from Ray. Uh, would a normalization of relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel jeopardize Saudi Arabia's leadership position in the Muslim world? And further, uh, 
would it perhaps have an effect uh, on other Muslim countries uh, 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 like Indonesia in normalizing their relations with Israel? I think it would give their opponents a stick to hit them with if they did it before there was a consensus. I think a consensus is forming more quickly than many. The Arab League, for example, did not denounce the, um, the uh, Emirati Agreement. So the Arab world is, I think, growing weary of this. They got their own, if you will, unending war uh, with Israel. I think they're getting tired of never ending wars. I think uh, the consensus will happen, but I don't think, I think if they did it today, yes, the answer is they would, um, I don't think they would, they would not bring a lot of people with them because today they would probably get pilloried. So that's why they're not going to do it today, I think. But in time they will. And I think quietly behind the scenes, that's what they're doing. And they have been doing that for some time. And they do that, they do that, with, they do that with a lot of different ways. But one of the ways they do, do it with is, is a checkbook. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, a couple of questions here. Please describe uh, Saudi relations with China. Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, a lot of smart people asking a lot of good questions. Um, China is, you know, the, the biggest change in the global situation in the last, certainly in the last 10 years, probably the last 20 years, is uh, the rise of China. Uh, China is now Saudi Arabia's biggest customer for oil. Uh, Saudi Arabia has become a strategic partner. They have the Chinese have a they have a list of a sort of a matrix of how good a friend of theirs you are, and that Saudis have opened relationships, and then they went from the first level. I think they're now at the, there's I think there are three levels. Anyway, they're in the second level now. They're called a strategic partner. They've agreed to participate in the Belt and Road Agreement. Uh, as you probably know, this, they, this was some years ago, the Chinese provided the Saudis with uh, ballistic missiles. Um, so they have a strong relationship with China economically. Uh, the, um, militarily, they, the, the, the missiles were kind of a one-off deal, but uh, they do have a strong economic relationship. And I would argue that they have a strong security relationship in a way that we perhaps don't realize. And what do I mean by that? Um, we all know that the, so they claimed they blamed the Houthis, but we all know it was the Iranians who had a drone attack on Abqaiq, which is a gas processing facility, an oil and gas, basically a separating facility that uh, is very important to Saudi oil exports. And the United States made it clear we didn't like that and we didn't want it to happen again and we, that there might be reaction if we did it again. It took Saudis, half Saudi's oil production off the mine for a couple of months. Uh, we sent some Patriot missiles there to uh, defend uh, against drones, which they aren't really terribly effective against drones, but we did that as a statement. But the Chinese, what did the Chinese do? The Chinese went to the Iranians and they said, no, we're the only people still buying your oil. And we're the only people that are helping you rebuild your, um, your uh, oil industry. And we happen to have a refinery deal that's on on the table right now and it just went off the table because we don't like the idea of you taking out half the Saudis oil production because guess what we're their biggest customer so that didn't help us so please don't do it again so um, I think that the Saudis um, understand that the um, Iranians or that the, the Chinese have leverage on the Iranians that perhaps we don't in some ways and uh, that's helpful to them so I think they have a strong relationship with China uh, I don't think that the United States is being displaced by China uh, at any time soon as the power that really guarantees the security of this part of the world. Uh, but I think it's a strong relationship, just like the one they have with Russia. Uh, it's also a strong relationship. And so another question is, uh, even if they're not displacing the United States, how will uh, increased uh, Saudi-Chinese relations affect the United States? How will it affect the United States? Well, I think it's, a, it's another factor that we, we will have to um, consider. We, we are not the hegemon that we were uh, 
in the Gulf, uh, even 10 years ago. We now, uh, we, there are other powers, uh, the Russians and the Chinese are both here in a much, in the Middle East, I would, I would not just say the Gulf, I mean, in the Middle East in general. I mean, Russia and China are much bigger players. Uh, China in the Gulf, Russia in the rest of the Middle East, and we have to um, take, them in t take them and their interests into consideration, and we have to negotiate with them to find solutions uh, to most of the problems that exist today. I mean, Syria being a, one example, Libya being another example, uh, that uh, they have influence uh, that we will have to um, take into consideration in, any in anything we do, politically or militarily. Here's a couple of questions about what might be the elephant in the room right now, and that is the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, who mm -hmm. we both knew. Uh, one question from Stephen, how does the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi weigh in, weigh in considering whether we are a witness to a coherent, consistent vision uh, or window dressing? Uh, and then uh, a further question uh, related to that. Uh, why did, from Donald, why did the Saudi government kill Khashoggi rather than take less extreme alternatives? Why did MBS think he killed Khashoggi and not suffer repercussions? Well, let me answer the second question first. I'm, um, I'm not sure they did set out to kill him, to be honest. I mean, no, I don't know this for a fact, but I would agree with the um, questioner that, um, killing him was rather dramatic. Uh, and he was, there were people who were far greater threat to um, the Saudi regime than Jamal Khashoggi ever was. So I speculate that they attempted to kidnap him. I, they do kidnap people. They have kidnapped people. I know people they've kidnapped. Uh, we kidnap people. We call it rendition. Uh, but uh, they, they do that. Uh, and so my view is that they were probably attempting to do that. Um, people will come back and they say, well, then why did they bring a bone saw if they were planning to um, kidnap him? And I have actually looked into that quite um, diligently. I have tried to find out where this story about the bone saw comes from. And as far as I have been able to find out, it was an anonymous source. And I've asked many people this. Uh, it was an anonymous source that told a pro-government Turkish newspaper and it was then published in that Turkish newspaper and picked up by journalists around the world. Um, and the story went that the, because nobody ever produced a picture of this bone saw, uh, supposedly they saw it on the x-rays of the incoming luggage. Maybe, I don't know. Um, and then there's also the story that the, um, the Baroness, I forget her name, who was a UN human rights lady who was listened to the tapes yeah, a coat of yard, I think her name was, or something like that. She says that she heard a buzzing sound, but she couldn't tell what it was. The Turks claim that that buzzing sound was a saw. Uh, who knows? So I, I don't know the answer to that, really. It, uh, it, I would agree with the questioner. I think he was, he was asking, why would you do this? And I would argue that I think that was probably not the intent. I think it would have been, if it was, it was pretty stupid. I would agree that it was pretty stupid. Um, how does it affect our relationship? Um, it obviously sent the relationship into a tailspin, um, and it, and it uh, did a lot of damage to MBS and to his reputation and to his ability to, um, to get uh, the help that he needs to succeed from the West. Um, I think that in time, uh, that those that that damage will be overcome and people say well why do you say that and i'd say look there were things like the 73 oil embargo which did huge damage to the american economy there were things like 9 11 which was again not the saudi government but was blamed in many people's minds on saudi arabia um, those things happened and they were overcome. The relationship proved strong enough to overcome them. And I think in the end, uh, the United States will see that uh, a strong and stable Saudi Arabia is very much in our interest and that we should want, quite frankly, we should want Vision 2030 to succeed. It's in our interest that it succeeds. And if, I don't know if you saw, there was an article, an editorial in the New York Times today, basically saying that the only hope for the Middle East is not the Iranians or the Islamists, but 
moderate modernizers. They didn't say MBS, but it was pretty clear that that was the type of person they were talking about. So he is a moderate modernizer. He's try and um, I think in the in the long run, he's the person that we will hopefully be able to work with uh, to keep a stable Saudi Arabia and to help Saudi Arabia become a more diversified economy and a tolerant uh, society. Here's another question about China. What leverage does Saudi Arabia hold over the U.S. by using uh, dollar-denominated uh, oil transactions, petrodollar, versus the possible threat of using a petro yuan, uh, particularly now that China is by far OPEC's largest customer and the U.S. is an OPEC competing exporter? What is our end of the bargain? I'm not sure. Can, what are what do we get out of it, or what do the Saudis get out of it? What's the chance the Saudis would switch from dollar-denominated transactions to uh, renminbi I transactions? Think, I don't think I don't think that's a, I don't think that's very likely. Um, I, there are reasons why you could argue that they should, uh, but that would be a real um, stick in the eye of the United States. And I don't think that they are going to do that. I mean, there there are already some transactions which are um, global transactions which are done in uh, in Chinese currency. But for Aramco to start pricing in uh, Chinese currency, that would be a real um, stick in the eye of the Americans. And I don't think the Saudis would do that. Um, and I'll give you an example. I mean, when they went and bought these missiles, um, and they bought missiles because they felt threatened by Iraq. Uh, and in and Iran, in the Iraq, not they weren't threatened by Iraq then. They were threatened. They felt threatened by Iran um, during the Iraq-Iran war. Um, and the and this is well known that the um, the then ambassador to the United States, Bandar bin Sultan, said, "Okay, we need these missiles. The Americans will not sell them to us. So we'll let's go to Russia. They make good missiles." And the king said, "No." This is King Fahad said, no, we're not going to go deal with the Russians. The Russians are the arch enemies in the Cold War of the Americans. So we'll get them from the Chinese and that will make the Americans mad, but they won't be quite as mad as if we get them from the uh, Russians. So they're, I think they're conscious of that. And I think um, to start trading in the uh, Remimbis would, would, would damage the relationship and they wouldn't yeah. want to do that. I also think quite frankly that they're used to dealing in dollars. I mean, the dollar is the reserve currency and they want to keep that, and their currency has been pegged to the dollar, and they have a lot of reasons why they like keeping it pegged to the dollar, uh, and so I think that's, they have lots of, anyway, I, I don't think it's going to happen. I guess right. that's the answer. Okay, I've got 11 questions left in seven minutes, so we're going to do yeah, kind I of a lightning round. I gotta, let's see if we can do this. All right. Let's see right. We can do Quickly from Rachel, if the U.S. sells F-35s to UAE, will Saudi Arabia be next in line? Uh, probably yes, I would think so. But you got to remember that F six F thirty fives are not all the same. I can tell you one that has a radar for thirty five miles and one for ten miles, and uh, you're the great the guy with the ten mile is not really in the same league with the guy with the thirty mile radar. So selling the airplane doesn't matter. It's the avionics and the weapons that go with it. Uh, in twenty five words uh, or less, what's the relationship between Saudi Arabia and Qatar? Strained. Very strained. That's the two words. <laughs> Very strained. Um, Way well, out. The, the, the Saudis, the Saudis um, believe that the um, Qataris fund um, anti-Saudi institutions and regimes. Uh, this, this goes back a long ways. This goes back to the grandfather of the current emir who was thrown out by the father of the current emir in a coup that the Saudis did not back that the Saudis and the Emiratis actually strongly opposed and to some extent tried to reverse. Um, and it also goes to the fact that the Qataris give support to the Muslim Brotherhood and that they and give sanctuary to some people who the Saudis um, consider to be their opponents and, and uh, fund a radio station television network, which the Saudis believe is very antagonistic to them and their interests. So those relationships are strained. However, I think everybody realizes that the problem has gone on long enough, and I would not be surprised if it comes to an end before too long. Well, here's an, here's an easy question. What's the story on the war with Yemen? Is it cost just, justified? Uh, the war with Yemen, that is more than two sentences. Um, 
I use, when I talk about that in any length, I, I, I use three analogies. The first analogy is the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Saudis, like the Americans, were not willing to have an adversary put missiles 90 miles from their border. They didn't want the Iranians in uh, Yemen any more than we, uh, than we wanted the Cubans, uh, the Soviets in Cuba. Um, the second analogy is that, uh, like the United States and Afghanistan, the Saudis did not expect to be there five years later. We did not expect to be in Afghanistan 20 years later after we went there. And the third analogy is with Vietnam, uh, having realized that there's no military victory here to be had, they are now attempting to negotiate a, a solution, which is not easy, particularly when the other guy knows you want to get out. Uh, so I think those, that's a quick answer to the Yemen situation. Yes, it's a disaster um, and it, it's, they're trying to get out, but it's not easy. You have, uh, here's a question uh, about the Arab, the so-called Arab Spring. Um, you have some good passages in your book about this. How is it that the Saudis avoided uh, the uh, fate of other regimes uh, in the Arab Spring? And uh, could something like that still happen in Saudi Arabia? It's, a good, it's another good question. Um, you and I were there for the insurrection when Al Qaeda was really rampaging across the country in a, in a dramatic terrorist campaign. Uh, and what happened? The Saudi people, both the liberals and the conservatives, rallied to their own government because they did not want to see it overthrown. That's just a historical fact. We were there, we saw that. The Saudi people look around and they say, gee, we could have the Arab Spring. And then, then we could be like Syria, or gee, maybe we could be like uh, Yemen, or we could be like Libya. All these places where they had an Arab Spring, that worked out real well, didn't it? So, um, no, the Saudi people are not interested in a revolution. Uh, I th think that might be one of the things that would surprise you if you went there. Uh, they are, this, the government's a status quo government, and in many ways the people are a status quo people because they look around and they say, well, we're doing pretty well compared to the rest of our neighbors. Uh, here's a question from Alana. We, we've had... Uh evidence, as you put in your book, that uh, the Obama administration, and particularly President Obama, did not have a particularly warm relationship uh, with the Saudis. What would be your prediction of, a, of the U.S.-Saudi relationship in a Biden administration versus the Trump administration? Well, I would imagine that the Biden campaign won't like to hear this, but um, I would argue that after a year or so, they will have the same strong relationship maybe quieter, maybe less vocal, maybe less tweets. But the reality of the Saudi-American relationship is deep. Uh, the Saudis have supported American foreign policy initiatives for 70 years. They continue to do so. They continue to be a partner. Uh, in st they, do, they do help stabilize um, global energy prices. I mean, the fact of the matter is in 2018, when the president felt that oil prices were too high. He sent a tweet, and OPEC began to produce more oil. That is just a historical fact. And it, just this year, when the oil prices collapsed to the point that it was damaging the American industry, who did the Saudi, who did the president call in order to um, get prices back up? A little bit, at least. Uh, he didn't call the Russians. He didn't call the Iranians. He called the Saudis. So if we don't have a relationship with them, we lose that kind of leverage. Uh, and we certainly don't want um, to see ISIS or um, the Muslim Brotherhood controlling the mosque in Mecca. Uh, and then there's a, there's a strong economic relationship too. We sell the Saudis a lot of things, not just oil. They, so um, they sell us oil, but we sell them a lot of things. So no, I think there's a strong relationship. I think it will continue. Um, and, I, and I think that's just a reality. And, and, and that's a, a good note on, on how to conclude. And also, Ambassador Jordan, I see that your dog is saying it's time for dinner, seeing your <laughs> yeah. lab right behind you. Thank you so much, David, uh, for, for writing this excellent book. And I hope that our viewers will go to Interabang Books or to their nearest bookstore and, and pick up a, a copy of it. Well done, Vision or Mirage. Again, thanks so much for watching. And I hope to see you next week when we'll be in conversation with HR McMaster.